Lakeland Currents, your public affairs program for North Central Minnesota. Produced by Lakeland Public Television with host Ray Gildow. Production funding for Lakeland Currents is made possible by Bemidji Regional Airport, serving the region with daily flights to Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport. More information available at BemidjiAirport.org. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is sponsored by Niswa Tax Service. Tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Online at NiswaTax.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Lakeland Currents. The 8th Congressional District is a geographic huge place, 27,500 square miles, if you can imagine how big that is. The anchor of this is uh, the city of Duluth, which is Minnesota's fifth largest city, and about 63-64% of the people who live in the 8th District are considered to be urban, not, or are considered to be rural rather, not urban. And it's my great pleasure today to have the congressman from the 8th District here, Rick Nolan, and uh, welcome to Lakeland Currents. Well, thank you, I'm delighted to be here. It's a great program, great show, and, and, uh, and a great congressional district. By the way, it's bigger than 10 states. Is it really? Yeah. Wow, yeah. I can believe that, because yeah, it's, 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 it's long. It's pretty hard to go anywhere without getting, uh, you know, at least three or four hours coming and going in the car. And you know, at one time it was completely democratic when it was a little bit of a different geographic stretch than it is now. Yeah. And over the last few elections, it's been a lot closer balance between Republican and Democratic. Um, but the Iron Range area, the Duluth area, still I would guess is pretty much Democratic. That's probably where- Well, it is pretty good. Although, um, you know, there's this uh, Nate Silver, he's kind of the quintessential guru of campaigns and election analysis. And he, he analyzes every district in the country for their competitiveness. And um, he just finished analyzing the 194 Democrats. He'll do the same for the Republicans, but uh, mine is the most difficult race uh, in the country for a Democrat to win. Wow. And um, so, and on a, uh, some of the recent polling we're seeing on just a uh, generic basis, you know, we're gonna vote for, mm -hmm. Uh, would you vote for the Democrat or the Republican? The Republican uh, wins by about six points. Our most recent polling still shows me winning by about a similar amount. So, but it's a very, very competitive district until this thing in Georgia, it was the most competitive or expensive in the, in the country. Mm -hmm. It was a, well over $20 million, which is just obscene and uh, begs the question, you know, how does this happen? And we need to fix and change, uh, change that. It, uh, mm -hmm. uh, during the Jim Obastar, Obastar era, rather, pretty much a reliable district for the Democrats, wasn't oh, it? Oh, gosh. I mean, you could never call any statewide election until the 8th District vote came in because it was uh, always going to be huge. It was going to be 60, 75 percent Democratic, but it's not like that at all anymore. So now, <clears throat> from my perspective, whoever represents the district, and you are representing it now in your second term, it's just a tightrope to walk, isn't it? Because if you look at supporting, say, mining issues, you're going to have the environmentalists who are against that. Yeah. And I don't know if people who don't get involved with politics understand how challenging that is to balance these things out. Well, <laughs> it, it, it truly is. And, um, you know, you and I are in the same uh, age bracket, even though you look a lot younger than me. Yeah, I do. right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but you remember when we were kids, I mean, the rivers were running sewers and the lakes were catching on fire and acid rain was destroying the forest. The narrative then was, you know, we can't have all these environmental rules and regulations or nobody will be able to do any business. And uh, unfortunately, um, now that narrative has flopped, they're flipped. And you have people saying, well, we can't do any uh, mining uh, or manufacturing um, because then we won't have an environment. But there were many of us then and who continue now, myself included, to say, no, no, we got the brains, we got the science, uh, we certainly have the need, just muster up the political will, and uh, we should be able to do both. And, and we proved that we, we, we could. I mean, um, and we didn't know how they were gonna do it, uh, Ray, um, but you know, the automobile industry came up with a catalytic converter to scrub the sulfur out of uh, automobile exhaust and we stopped the acid mm -hmm. rain and the power companies and the paper mills came up with scrubbers to take the toxins uh, and, and other pollutants that were going into the rivers and the lakes. And, 
Um, we even have a thing now called uh, reverse osmosis, which we did not have back in the day. You can take a pump and, 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 and push some kind of a liquid through it. You can filter out a virus, you know. You can, how many parts of sulfur uh, per million do you want? You know, 300, 100, 10, mm -hmm. zero? Obviously, it gets more expensive um, the more you want to dial it down. But um, I'm of the view that we still have the smarts, the brains, the technology and the technologies keep growing and 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 getting better all the time, and um, um, we we have I think a profound obligation uh, to do both. You and the governor both have supported now the mining project up in northeast um, Minnesota, <clears throat> and could you just talk a little bit sure, about that? Sure, sure. And, and but before I do, I want to point out one thing. I just attended a lecture uh, here recently by a doctor. Jim Boyer, who's written a book called The um, Irresponsible Pursuit of Paradise. And he talks about how dependent we are upon the import of so many of these uh, extracted minerals that are responsible for our communications, responsible and necessary. Copper, uranium. Yeah, copper, yeah. nickel, iron <clears throat> ore, you name it. Um, and we're, we, we're actually exporting um, the uh, need for these minerals to developing countries around the world where they have no virtually no environmental rules and regulations and uh, a great deal of human exploitation. And that's something that people, uh, I think, have to start thinking about. Uh, we don't want to be a bunch of a nation of NIMBYs um, exporting uh, you know, and degradating everybody else's environment in the world, especially when we have the capacity and we have the most rigorous rules and regulations anywhere in the world. We have the capacity to do it here and do it well. Polymet uh, is, is, a, is a good case in point. They've undergone 12 years of scrutinization. They've been approved by the EPA, by the uh, uh, forestry, uh, by interior, by the DNR, by the PCA, by Fish and Wildlife Services. And time and time and again, they've been asked to go back to the board and to demonstrate what kind of abatement procedures they're going to use mm -hmm. and to demonstrate their effectiveness. Um, and um, so I, I've been the uh, same old guy I always was. I've been an ardent supporter of the environment, but I'm an ardent supporter of mining as well. Um, and um, I, I got to tell you something else that, that people haven't thought about in this. Of course, it's important for the jobs and the economy uh, in northern Minnesota. But guess what? Homeland Security just did a study recently, and they found that 13% of the nation's gross national product uh, goes through the locks at the Sioux Narrows. Now, why is that relevant to us? That, that's how Lake Superior gets into the Great Lakes. And the bulk of that uh, material is iron ore from Minnesota's range going through the uh, port of Duluth. And um, the study concluded that if those locks failed, uh, would throw the country into a Great Depression wow. because that ore supplies all the Great Lakes steel mills and they supply the automobile industry and all the heavy industrials, which is why uh, we have military protection there because, again, uh, if that failed because we shut down the mines or they, they failed just from obsolescence um, and or they were some kind of an asymmetrical or overt military attack, it would throw the country into a Great Depression and put uh, 7 million people uh, out of business. So, um, bottom line is, you know, I've been working to get the, uh, and I've gotten a considerable amount of money to do a feasibility study because the locks are obsolete and they're causing a lot of trouble. Um, but um, more importantly, you know, this mining here in northern Minnesota is, of course, important for us, but it's important for the whole country, mm -hmm. our national security, our national economy. And uh, the tourism is important too, so we have to make sure that uh, we impose and insist on these rigorous uh, state and federal standards. Um, but for the most part, industry is okay with that. You know, they used to fight that. They now mm -hmm. understand the American sure. people expect, um, you know, good, strong standards. So as long as we have those good standards in place, there's no reason why we can't do mining uh, and have uh, a continuous of the, the clean uh, water and the healthy atmosphere we have up here in the 8th District. We have the cleanest water in the state, by the way. In the 8th want to keep it that way. Right. Yep. Yep. Uh, some of the key issues facing the 8th District are the same issues facing all of Minnesota. Health care is certainly one of them. Yeah. And now this week as they start negotiating the tax bill, 
uh, at least on the Senate side or the House side, I can't remember which was, it, it looks like they might start looking at that American health care or the AC, uh, American... Yeah, the ACA. ACA. Yeah, American. And uh, taking otherwise out known some, as Obamacare. Taking out the requirement that you have to have yeah. insurance. Yeah, what, What's your take on what's... What, yeah, <laughs> it's hard to figure out what's yeah. going on. I, I don't believe. Well, it's a moving I target. It's, I it's changing. You are the answer to all yeah. this, but no, no, it's changing <laughs> from day to day. But the essential uh, challenge here is is that um, under the current system, um, outside of Medicare uh, and and some Medicaid. Everybody in America has got a different insurance policy, depending on how old you are, what your health is, what your income is, how many children you have, how many dependents you have, uh, what's your zip code. And it's become an administrative nightmare. Um, I introduced the, uh, one of the first single-payer uh, proposals when I had served in the Congress back in the 70s. There were, there were only four of us that supported it at the time. And, and, I, and what is single-payer? You know, it, it, first of all, it's what most of the rest of the world, developed countries in the world do. And, um, and, and um, they get better results and they, they pay dramatically less for health care than we do. It, it, it's, it's so fundamentally American. And here's what it is. Everybody's got the same policy, okay? So administratively, you do it for 2 3% instead of 30 40 50%. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and everybody, everybody pays. So um, between, uh, and everybody pays the same rate. 19 so different. everybody pays, everybody <clears throat> pays the same rate, and everybody pays. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, formula. And of course it doesn't cover some of the more exotic uh, plastic surgery, but it covers all the basics. Mm -hmm. So all the developed countries, and they do that, and that's fundamentally what Medicare is, which is why uh, a number of people have called, you know, for Medicare for all because that's a single payer. It's not a socialized. It's not socializing medical care, but it uh, the the doctors remain um, independent uh, business businesses providing health services. But I wanted to tell you when I introduced this, there were four of us back in the seventies. Okay, and oh my gosh, the medical community they were so upset with me. My gosh. It was frightening sometimes to go to a public meeting. I'm afraid I'd get my tongue or ripped out or my eyes ripped out. And, uh, and they spent a lot of money trying to defeat me. Well, here we are, you know, quite some years later. Uh, we have 130 sponsors now. And guess who's contributing to my campaigns? The American yeah, Medical Association really? and the medical doctors. Why? I've had a, a doctor in Duluth tell me he's spending 90%. And I think on average they say they're spending about 50% of their time and their money in their offices processing uh, all of these insurance claims. I've had doctors on this show and they all say the same thing. Yeah, and that's not <laughs> what they went into medicine for. Right. They went into medicine uh, to, 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 it's a healing arts profession. They want to heal people and fix people. Mm -hmm. They don't want to sit around being uh, medical insurance uh, process uh, 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 claimers. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that's exciting, and we're building more and more support for that, and, and we're going we're gonna to get there. And I'm, I'm confident that uh, it's just going to take a little more time. Uh, I believe last year you were voted as one of the most successful uh, congressmen in, vote, in working across the aisle. I, you know, I was, and it, 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 um, and it actually wasn't a vote. Um, uh, several of the universities, Virginia and Vanderbilt, they just looked at bills and amendments that all the members of Congress had introduced and followed them to see uh, how many of them had become law of the land. And I'm, 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 I'm proud to say that I became, I was the, the, the second most effective of all 194 Democrats in, in the House and one of the 10 most effective. Um, and then they concluded from that, being that I'm in the minority, and I remind myself and others that mm -hmm. I had I had bipartisan support for all that legislation. And um, um, you know, you and I were talking earlier about um, uh, the uh, the George Washington's uh, farewell address and how poignant it is for today. It was kind of a message um, for future generations, where he said the greatest threats to democracy were, um, as, as, as I recall, one is excessive partisanship. Correct. We certainly got that today. Yep. Um, the other um, was the accumulation of massive deficits. Um, That's and, and we certainly uh, have that today. 
And um, the third one was um, um, uh, influenced by foreign governments on our politics, and we certainly have that today. Um, uh, what an incredibly uh, visionary view Washington And I think there was had. something even about uh, the president or the whoever's in power starting to have influence in the Department of Justice and some of those people to use those for their own political game. I think that was another one yeah. of the things he touched yeah. on. Yeah, one of the things that we <clears throat> needed to be aware of if we wanted to preserve and protect the republic. So it's kind of an ironic. And the <laughs> other thing about it was is that, you know, he epitomized uh, civility and integrity, you know, never tell a lie. Um, uh, he, he just, he made people then proud of our government and, uh, uh, and, and our way of life and uh, to this day, uh, as the, our first president, he makes us proud. And there's been a tremendous uh, degradation of, of civility and, and kindness and integrity in government. And it's, it breaks your heart to see uh, so many people losing faith and trust in their governmental processes. Um, it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of things that need fixing, and I've got some ideas about how we fix them, but um, they definitely need fixing. I think we can all agree on that. One of the things you talked about when you were here two years ago was the pressure that's on incoming congressmen and senators to raise money. Yeah. Is that still, oh. is that still the same pressure you're dealing with? Yeah, it, it is. It's, it's only gotten worse, right? Really? Yeah. Um, they tell uh, um, the new members that they should spend 25, 30 hours a week in the call centers across wow. the street. Um, wow. Wow. Um, and then you should have another 10 hours a week in um, actual fundraising events. And, um, you know, in, in my case, uh, it's an eight hour uh, trip um, out to Washington, door to door. <laughs> and I, I go out and come back every week. So, you know, do the math on, on, on that. And uh, enough I, I made a decision. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to go to the call centers. They never used to exist when I served before or any other point in, in history. I just said, look, at, at this stage of my life, uh, being a chance to go and serve and pay it forward, pay it back, because life's been good to our generation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's what's getting away from this country. Uh, I said I didn't go out to Washington to become a middle-level uh, telemarketer and uh, dialing for dollars, <laughs> and uh, so I haven't. So you know, I'd like to, I'd like to say my success as a legislator is be my ability to reach across the aisle, find public partners, but part of it's just going to work on the people's business sure. instead of going across the street sure. uh, raising money for yourself. Yeah. It ain't a big secret. I don't care what business uh, you're in. If you don't show up and go to work, you're not gonna get anything right. done. Right. So it ain't rocket science. But I want to see um, I want to see this uh, Citizens United uh, reverse. That allows all this dark uh, money uh, into politics, most of which is negative and degrading of, of, of the can. Discourages good people from running for sure. public office. I think we need a system of small donor uh, uh, co contributions uh, supplemented by uh, public financing. I think we need to fix gerrymandering. The fact that there's 435 seats in the Congress and only 24 of them are competitive. Um, that, that's not real democracy. We need to have regular order. Uh, right now, I just, just saw a report yesterday. Um, this uh, current Congress has had more closed rules than any other Congress in the history of the country. Uh, when I served before, everything came up under an open rule. If you had an idea, you, you offered it, and you debated it, and you argued it, and that's how you find common ground. But this health care legislation, you know, some of which would put as many as 25, 30 million people on the streets without health care, and uh, never been presented in it with an opportunity to um, make an amendment. Uh, the, the Congress, uh, the House uh, just recently passed the uh, a tax bill under a closed rule. <laughs> it didn't matter if you were uh, Rick Nolan or uh, Clem Kadippelhopper, you know, from <laughs> Alabama. Um, if you had an amendment you wanted to offer, you didn't get a chance. They just voted up or down. Wow. Um, that's not real democracy. No, no. Real democracy is a lot of work. You have, to, you have to hear everybody out and make some tough decisions, but uh, now it's mostly just partisan positioning and one party ruling and, um, and shutting everybody else out. That, let's just talk a little bit about that tax uh, legislation because mm -hmm. that is the, the criticism coming from lots of places yeah. that this is being rushed through on you know, after Thanksgiving there was, there was going to be or was a vote, and um, 
it's not involving people even from industry or people from oh. the colleges who are experts and economists <clears throat> and those people when they get a chance to start looking at the legislation yeah. they're pretty much petrified by what they're seeing and it's you know the same claim yeah. was made against the Democrats with Obamacare that that stuff was rammed through uh, but that took over a year to develop it that did. legislation. Yeah. And this legislation for the taxes we, is we, taking we, weeks. Yeah. We didn't have one minute of hearings on this tax bill that the House uh, recently passed. And I, I am of the belief that if we had a vote on whether or not uh, kids who are struggling with uh, uh, their education, well, they're no longer kids anymore, they're paying their student debt. If we had a vote on whether or not the interest on their loans should be deductible, uh, we, we'd win that, mm -hmm. you know? If we had a vote on whether or not your state and local taxes should be deductible, we'd, we'd win that. If we had a vote on whether charitable contributions or you name it, you know, we would win those, but we don't have any votes on that. Everybody that's contacted me in my office, you know, in, in the run up to this uh, tax debate uh, has really serious uh, problems with it. Our Minnesota commissioners determined that under the House pass bill, uh, 450,000 Minnesotans are going to get a tax increase. Uh, they found that um, uh, 320,000 people would lose the deductibility on the interest for their uh, college education loan. Geez, Ray, you know, when you and I went to college, it was about 100 bucks a quarter. I mean, yeah, it, was it was virtually free. Yeah, huh? it was. Come on. So, um, uh, and the truth of the matter is, if somebody does get a tax break under this thing in the middle class, Although the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, said anybody making under $70,000 a year is going to get a tax increase. Um, uh, if, you did, it'd be, it'd, if you did get a break, it'd be enough to buy a hubcap, you know, on a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> but, you know, the, the upper one percenters, you know, they, they, they'll be able to buy uh, the, the whole Mercedes Benz and maybe a fleet of them. There's $1.5 trillion in tax breaks for the upper one percent. And it's increasing the debt. And pass it well. That, that, you know, the <laughs> things most egregious about this are one that's passing that debt on to our children. That's unconscionable. One point five trillion dollars, um, and, and then this huge tax crate for the super millionaires and billionaires, the one percenter. Uh, I'm sorry, they're not struggling. I don't know a lot of them, but I, I do yeah. happen to know a couple of them, and they're doing just fine. And um, uh, and. And then it's going to impose a tax increase on the middle class that's struggling so hard. It's a terrible bill, terrible bill. Bodes very poorly for our, our, our country's future. At a time when the rich are getting richer and degrees unparalleled, uh, the middle class is getting crushed every which way they turn, and um, and and the poor are just getting poorer. And uh, the, this disparity in wealth has never been so great in this country since just before the Great Depression. Wow. So that does not so, well. so when you have private conversations with your peers across mm -hmm. the aisle, they must feel some of the pressure of dealing with this too, even though maybe they have oh, to they take do. the party line. Yeah. Because my experience yeah. has been when you get yeah. politicians in the back rooms and they're yeah. alone, they're just like yeah. we are. Um, <clears throat> you know, Mark Meadows uh, uh, heads that uh, Tea Party Liberty uh, Conference or caucus. Um, um, He's one of my better friends there in the Congress. And you know what? Uh, he and, and the Tea Party's not happy about the fact that everything's being decided in the Speaker's office. You know, they didn't come there for the photo op either. Whether you agree with them or not, we can find agreement on the fact that we need regular order where mm -hmm. everybody's got an opportunity to offer their amendments and have them argued and debated and voted on. Um, um, you know, generally, I talk to my Republican colleagues, you know, what's going to happen next week or next week or what's going to be in the bill, and I, say, I don't know. <laughs> you know, they're not included. That's pretty discouraging. It's very discouraging. We, we're down to the last few minutes, and I know you want to talk a little bit about aquatic invasive species because I think you've done some work in that area. Yeah, I have. I, I most recently got um, an extra million dollars uh, for a, a, a aquatic invasive species research. Um, you know, we've seen here in the Brainerd Lakes area how rapidly zebra mussels uh, have expanded. And to the extent that that continues, it, it bodes very poorly for, uh, you know, our sport fishing, which is such an integral, important part of our life and our economy. And 
um, uh, we've 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 got to find ways, better ways to abate this. We got to do more research, you know, to find find ways to uh, uh, stop it and limit. And that's just one of a hundred or more other uh, invasive species that have come in or who are threatening our tourism or sport fishing. Um, you know, um, I don't know about what your dad, but my dad always said, you know, uh, Richard, if you don't think you don't have time for fishing, you're just wrong. <laughs> and uh, I said, how's that, dad? Because he said every day someone goes fishing adds a day to their life, so it doesn't oh, count in the span that's of life. That's very good philosophy, and, yes. And um, we, we've got to do a better job on that. That tourism is so huge in Minnesota. Yeah. And the spiny water fleas, uh, zebra mussels, yeah. you name it, it's, yeah. it's exploding. Yeah. It's, it's growing and yeah. growing. Uh, I had, CWD in our deer. Oh, yeah. Uh, I just talked to a friend who just came back from Montana. 22% of the deer tested in Montana have CWD. Wow. You know, it's not an invasive species. They don't really know. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, 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 uh, it's affecting Some the kind nervous of a parasite. system. It's like the, it's uh, threatening the, uh, it's the, like the mad the, cow disease yeah, almost. Yeah, it's threatening the moose population yeah, absolutely. as well. Absolutely. By the way, I was just saying also, you know how important the loon is? I mean, what an iconic... Uh, a bird and symbol for uh, the beauty of our Great Lakes in, in northern Minnesota. Cross Lake Minnesota is is busy with an initiative to create a national loon center. I just had oh, lunch. Really? Yeah, yeah. I just had lunch with the um, uh, president of the uh, Audubon Society, and believe it or not, the loon is on their uh, list of 300 uh, st species um, uh, most likely to be extinct by the end of the century. Wow. Uh, zebra mussels, uh, they have a parasite in them. There were 10,000 loons have lost their life from zebra mussels. So that, Pretty it, sad. Yeah, um, Very so sad. we got to get going. And so much of this evolves research. Um, and uh, you, you got to put the money up there to do the research, to find how you abate these, how you protect our important species. We've run out of time. I, I appreciate we, your uh, jumping out with us and sharing some of this information. How do people get in touch with you if they want to? You know, just go on the web and uh, just put in there Richard Nolan, uh, member of history. Congress. Yeah, and uh, they can get our uh, and we we get I get anywhere from a thousand to several thousand communications every week, wow. and I value it. I appreciate it. My wow. my staff gives me a report on every single one of them, and uh, and I look forward to that's one of the first things I do every Monday when I come into the office is look at the correspondence. Thank you very much Thank for appearing on the show. Oh, good. You've been watching Lakeland Currents where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow, so long until next time.